Good evening and a very warm welcome to our service of evening prayer this evening on this Palm Sunday evening. Seek the Lord while he is still to be found. Call to him while he is still near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and the evil their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord who will take pity on them and to our God who is rich in forgiving. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and there is no truth in us. If we confess our sins, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. When the light of that promise, let us confess our sins to the Father and seek his pardon and peace. But let us begin with a moment of silence as we each individually acknowledge our sin before God. Let us confess our sins together. Almighty and merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved others as Christ loves us. We are truly sorry. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory and praise of your name. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are here in the presence of the living God and the whole company of heaven to offer him our worship through Jesus Christ our Lord and to know more truly the greatness of his love. We have come to hear and receive his word, to seek the strength of his Holy Spirit, that our lives may bear the fruit of his grace, and to pray for the world, for the church, and for all those who are in need. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. To you we lift our eyes, for you are enthroned in the heavens. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Let us worship the Lord. All praise to his name. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you that stand by night in the house of our God. Lift up your hands toward the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, the Lord who made heaven and earth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Our psalm for this evening is Psalm 80. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and took, it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls, 
so that all who pass by pick its grapes. Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face to shine on us, that we may be saved. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Our second reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 5, the first seven verses. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleaned it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will, not, I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. This is the word of the Lord. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked with favour on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones, and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We turn now to our New Testament reading. This evening it's taken from Matthew 21, starting at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? 
He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard, rent the vineyard to the other tenants, who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Saviour, whom you have prepared for all the world to see. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Well, at this point we would normally look at one of the readings that's been set for this evening. But we're working through a two-part series on how to make sense of the coronavirus. We had part one last week, and so this evening we're going to have part two. Last week we began trying to make sense of the coronavirus by establishing a framework to help us think clearly about this important issue. And in fact, that framework is going to help us think clearly about God and all forms of what we might call natural evil. Everything that nature throws at us that is clearly at odds with God's ultimate purposes for the world. Disasters, calamities, sickness and so forth. So let's begin by briefly recapping. We compared what we were doing to building a house. And if you want to build a house, the first thing you need is a solid foundation. We saw that there's only one place where we can go to get a rock solid, reliable foundation. And that is God's word, the Bible. That's the place where God primarily reveals himself to us. As we dug together into God's word, we came up with two massive truths that will form the foundation for all of our thinking in this area. First, God is sovereign. Nothing happens without his permission. Second, God is good. He is just, he is loving, he is kind, he is wise in everything that he does. With our foundation laid, we then went on to start building the walls. We said that if, on the one hand, God is sovereign and so must permit natural disasters, and if, on the other hand, God is good, then it follows that God must have a good, loving, just, kind, wise purpose, even in permitting those things. But what are his purposes in permitting natural disasters and other forms of natural evil? Again, we don't want to try and second guess what they might be. Instead, we want to go to God's word and look in the Bible to see what the answer might be. And as we do, we see that God has two great purposes in all that he does. His glory and our good. Well, let's take a look at the second of those first. Our good. In Romans 8 verse 28 we read, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And note carefully what Paul is saying there under the inspiration of the Spirit. He says that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him. That means that God is at work in the bad things as well as the good things. He is at work in everything 
for the good of those who love him. Such is God's sovereignty that we can be confident that he is working through everything for our good if we are his. What then do we mean by our good? Well, I don't know about you, but when I think of what's good for me, I tend to think of whatever's going to bring me an easy and comfortable life. But that's not how God sees our good. God's concern for us is far, far deeper than that. He wants what is for our ultimate good, what will ensure that we land safe on heaven's eternal shore. And so he doesn't promise us an easy life here and now, but he does promise us a joy-filled eternity. Second, God's glory. In Romans 11 verse 36, we read that for from him, that is God, and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. In other words, God is at work in all things for his own glory. Well, what do we mean by God's glory? I think in essence, it simply means this, the display of his character. It is the display of who he is in all of his wonder, his beauty, his majesty. It's the display of the greatness of his love, the depths of his wisdom, the awesome might of his power, the perfect integrity of his justice, the tenderness of his kindness. But you might object, doesn't this make God a narcissist? if he's working in all things to display his own glory? The answer is no, but why not? Because the display of his glory is our ultimate good. It is the kindest, most loving thing that he can do for us. The more fully we see him as he really is, then the greater our joy and satisfaction in him will be. When we see just how much he loves us, just how kind he is, just how gracious he has been, it will thrill our hearts with joy and we will find the greatest satisfaction we can in him. His glory is our ultimate good. So actually these two purposes are often intertwined, God's glory and our good. And we have an illustration of how God works for our good and his glory and how these two things are intertwined in the story of Lazarus that we were looking at last week. You'll remember that Martha and Mary send a message to Jesus to say that Lazarus is sick. And so what does Jesus do when he hears? Well, he stays where he is for two more days. And by the time he gets to him, Lazarus is dead. Well, why does Jesus delay? Why doesn't he rush down to heal him? Well, the surprising answer that the text gives us is that it is because he loves them. John 11 verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus so, and notice that connective, so, he stayed where he was. How is that loving? He let Lazarus die. He let the sisters experience real, raw grief. How can a loving God do that? Because the removal of that suffering is not the ultimate good that God can do for them. The ultimate good is that they might see his glory. Why? Because their greatest joy and satisfaction lies in knowing that Jesus is not simply the Messiah, but that he is the resurrection and the life. He wants to show them who he really is so that they might know unparalleled satisfaction and joy in him. He acts to display his glory because it is for their good and his motive through it all is love. And I think that principle that we find here in the story of Lazarus actually applies to every area of our lives. 
Well, let's briefly recap on where we've got to. We've said that God is sovereign. Nothing happens without his permission. Secondly, that God is good in everything that he does. And we've said that God has a good, loving, just, wise purpose in everything that he allows, even coronavirus and other forms of natural evil. And that his purpose through it all is that he is working for his glory and for our good. And as we've seen from the story of Lazarus, his motive through it all is love. If someone had told me 20 years ago that God is absolutely sovereign and that he allows suffering for his glory and our good, I don't think I could have accepted it. But the more that I've looked at the Bible and tried to take seriously what it says, the more convinced I've become that this is what the Bible teaches. Not only that, but in it, there is the greatest possible comfort and security. Jim Packer, the celebrated Anglican theologian, puts it like this. To know that nothing happens in God's world apart from God's will may frighten the godless, but it stabilises the saints. I don't know if we will be affected individually by coronavirus, but certainly one day our lives will be rocked by natural evil, whether it comes in the form of disaster, sickness, death or loss. We might think of our lives as being like a boat on a journey. When a boat sets sail, sets sail on the ocean, it needs to have ballast or weight in the hull to prevent it from capsizing when a storm comes. And unless we have the right ballast in our boats, we're going to find the storms of life overwhelming. The ballast we need is God's word, not our personal opinion. We may find God's word incredibly challenging, both intellectually and emotionally at times. But it is the only ballast that will keep us upright when the storms of life hit. And in particular, the ballast that we need at the bottom of our boats is to know that God is absolutely sovereign. That God is incomprehensibly good. God is unfailingly working all things for his glory and our good. The Heidelberg Catechism is one of the great statements of faith to come out of the Reformation. It's structured as a series of questions and answers. Question 27 asks, what do you mean by God's providence? Providence refers to the way in which God cares for the world. The answer that the Catechism gives is this. The almighty and ever-present power of God, by which God upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things in fact come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. That summary of biblical truth is ballast for our boats. It doesn't mean that grappling with suffering suddenly becomes an easy thing. It doesn't mean that when the waves hit, our worlds are not rocked by them. But it does mean that our ship will stay upright in the midst of the storm because we know that underneath are the everlasting arms. All of our lives have been touched or will be touched by natural evil in some way, whether it is sickness, bereavement, disability, some other loss. It's often impossible to understand why God has permitted what he has permitted. But we know him, and so we trust him, and we trust that in all things he is sovereignly working it out to his glory and to our good. Well, some people may have objections to what we have said 
so far. I've identified three particular objections that I'd like to address in closing. The first objection is this. Is this really what the Bible teaches about God's sovereignty? We can categorically say yes. We looked last week at a number of verses that told us that God permits everything that happens, that nothing is beyond his control, that he doesn't tolerate what he doesn't want to tolerate. And they weren't the only verses. Isaiah 45 and verse 7, God says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amos 3 verse 6, when a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? And Lamentations 3.38 Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? We can be sure that all that happens in the world happens because God permits it. But that then raises another objection. Doesn't this then make God the author of evil? And in answer to that, we must say a categoric no. God does not cause these events. He only permits them. God does not cause evil. He only permits it. The events that we have been thinking about, natural evil, calamities, disasters, sickness and so on. They are evil things. They are caused by evil forces at work in the world. They are opposed to God and his good creation. And God hates them. Another Reformation confession put it like this. God permits evil not as something pleasing to him, but as something that he hates. However, God's sovereignty is such that he can use even these things that he hates for his glory and for our good. This is one of the key lessons of the book of Job. And another clear example of this is found in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. As you read through the beginning of 2 Corinthians 12, you read about Paul telling us about this extraordinary vision of heaven that he had. And then he says in verse 7, In order to keep me from becoming conceited because of that vision, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. That thorn in his flesh was evil. It was a messenger of Satan, but it was permitted by God for his good purposes. To keep Paul from becoming conceited, that certainly wasn't Satan's purpose. The messenger of Satan intended only to harm Paul, but God used it to Paul's good and for his own glory. This is so important to see because... It means that God and Satan are not, as some people can think, like two Greek gods battling things out. No, no, God is totally sovereign. He is totally sovereign even over Satan. Satan can only do what God permits him to do. And even then, it will only be for God's glory and our good well, our third and final objection is this. Doesn't all of this just lead to fatalism? If God permits natural evil, shouldn't we just resign ourselves to it? If God has allowed the coronavirus for his good and for our glory, doesn't that mean that there's nothing we can really do about it? We just have to say, que sera, sera. 
the answer is again an emphatic no we do not worship an impersonal distant cold god of fate rather we worship the tender hearted heavenly father we read about in the bible and as we read the bible it tells us there are two ways we respond to evil. First, we lament. The Bible is full of cries of lament when we're confronted with disaster and calamity. We just have to read the Psalms to see this. We need to remember that God permits sin and evil, but he hates it more than we do. He permits it, but remember, as something ple not pleasing to God, but as something that he hates. God hates coronavirus. He hates sickness. He hates disease. And it is right that when it strikes, we should not try and be stoic about it, but rather we should lament. And as we lament, we lament with a God who is not distant, but a God who has come down who has lived our human experience and has suffered. And in fact, he has suffered far more than any of us ever will. He cried out on the cross for us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus's great cry of lament. And so as we lament, as we face suffering, we do not do so alone. But we do so with a God who understands exactly what we're going through. With a God who has endured our suffering. With a God who stands shoulder to shoulder with us in it. But we're not just to lament, we're also to resist. When we become ill, we do not become passive and say, well, that's God's will for me. We all go down to the doctor and see if we can get some help. Or when we see that there's a locust infestation in East Africa, as there is at the moment, we don't just shrug our shoulders and say, well, whatever will be, will be. We give generously. We hope that some solution can be found to this great problem. And we do all that is within our power to enable that. And above all, in every situation, we pray. And we pray because God is sovereign. We pray knowing that we pray to one who has the power to do something about the situation we are facing, if he so chooses. And if he chooses not to answer in the way that we hoped that he might, we know that he does it in love for our good and for his glory. Well, how can we sum up what we have said so far today? Well, we've seen that our rock solid foundation for thinking about God and how he relates to these different types of natural evil that we've been thinking about is that he is sovereign and that he is good. He is absolutely sovereign and he is incomprehensibly good. And then we've seen building on that foundation that if God is sovereign and God is good, then he must have good purposes in permitting all that he does. What is the purpose to which, towards which he is working all things it is for his glory and for our good and his motive in it all is love and that is the ballast we need in the bottom of our fragile boats that doesn't mean that life is going to suddenly be easy or that suffering becomes insignificant Suffering is agony, it is painful, and it is baffling. We seldom know why God permits what he permits, but we do know him. And because we know him, we trust him. 
Following Jesus can be very painful at times, but this is the promise that he makes to us. Now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, when he comes again. Only God understands the full picture. Only he knows why he permits what he permits. But we know that in all things he is working for our good. You are precious to him and you can entrust your whole life to him. All that we have suffered in this life is going to be made up to us countless times over when we go to be with him. Today is Palm Sunday. And as we think about how baffling our lives can be, why it is that God permits what he permits, how he is in all things working for our good and his glory. So I found myself reflecting on that first Palm Sunday. I don't know what the disciples were thinking as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. I wonder if they thought that the very best thing that Jesus could do for them would be to overthrow the Romans and establish his kingdom. That he was in fact riding into Jerusalem to die would have been totally incomprehensible to them. And yet he was. Why was he doing that? Because he loved them. And the laying down of his life was necessary to secure God's glory and their good. From their limited perspective, they couldn't understand the events that were unfolding in the coming days. But looking back, they would be able to say, yes, now I understand why he has done what he has done. And I thank him for it a million times over. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that we are not responsible for ruling the world. We thank you that you do that and you do it perfectly. We thank you that you are sovereign completely that you are incomprehensibly good in everything that you do. And we thank you that in everything you are working all things out to your glory and to our good. We thank you that there will come a day when we will look back as well. And we will be able to say of those things that have baffled us in this life, now I understand and I am thankful that he permitted what he permitted. Father, we pray until that day that you would sustain us each day by your grace as you renew our faith and confidence in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe and trust in God the Father who created all that is. I believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind. I believe and trust in his Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God. I believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Renew your church in holiness and give your people the blessing of peace. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Do not let the needy, O God, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Lord, hear our prayer, for we put our trust in you. Our collect for this evening. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Eternal God, source of all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works, give your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that we may willingly obey your commandments and that free from the fear of our enemies we may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lighten our darkness, Lord, we pray, and by your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn now to our intercessions. As we come to you in prayer, we remember that you are the one eternal God, sovereign over the nations, whose name is love and who is working all things for your glory and for our good. At the beginning of what is likely to be the most difficult fortnight for this country during the course of the pandemic, we pray for the medical professionals, hospital staff and researchers responsible for fighting the coronavirus. We pray for our doctors and nurses. We pray that you would sustain them in good health at this time, that they might be able to keep treating and caring for patients. We ask that they would not be overwhelmed by whatever may happen and that they would not be in fear of it. We pray for the work of the ethics committees around the country, especially as they may be forced to make the agonising decisions about who should receive treatment and who should not. We pray that you would give them wisdom and compassion. We pray for the senior leaders in hospitals and the health service, that you would enable them to keep a clear head and make good decisions at this time of tremendous strain. We pray for those at every level whose work is vital, for cleaners, for clinical support workers, for catering staff, for the administrative staff. We pray that you would protect them all and enable them to continue to serve. We pray for the resources that are so desperately needed at this time, for the various types of equipment and especially the personal protective equipment that is needed by medical staff. We pray that the supply chains would not fail, but that they would continue to supply 
all that is required. And we pray especially for Christians within the NHS. We pray that at this time of tremendous stress and uncertainty, they might shine as stars. We pray that in everything they do and say, you would enable them to be faithful witnesses to their Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those at higher risk of developing the disease, and at greater risk from it should they contract it. In a moment of silence, we bring before you those who are known to us personally, who are elderly, or who have underlying health conditions. We pray that you would protect those whom we have named from harm. We pray that you would comfort their loved ones. We pray that you would sustain them in their isolation. And we pray that in their fear and anxiety, they would look to you the only true rock in this uncertain world. We pray that through faith in you, they might know true peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for all of our leaders at every level of government as they make decisions that affect the lives and futures of our families, our communities, our countries and the wider world. We pray that they might have wisdom for all the decisions they will need to make in the coming weeks and months. And we pray that you would enable them to communicate clearly, truthfully and calmly, both with each other and with the public. And we pray that their message might be received and heeded. We pray for our Queen as she addresses the nation tonight. We pray again that her words would be received and heeded by the country. And we pray for our leaders that at this time they would not look to their own strength. We pray that they might instead look to you and cast all their cares upon you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for families as they adjust to new ways of life. We ask that you would give families grace for each other. We pray that this time might be a time of rediscovering what we have lost in a world of individualised wall-to-wall entertainment. We pray that families would grow stronger and that our wider communities would come together. We pray especially for Christian families. We ask that they might take seriously their responsibility to care for one another spiritually. We pray for families within our church that this might be a time of spiritual and relational growth. We especially remember those who are living alone. We pray that they would not be anxious or fearful. But Father, we pray that they might turn to you and know that you are with them at all times. We pray that this time would not be a wasted time, but we pray that it might be a time in which they grow spiritually. We pray for their network of friends, that they might be active in caring for them. We pray especially for our own church family, Father, our great prayer is that no one would fall through the net, but that we would care for one another as we go through this time together without being able to see one another face to face. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for businesses. We thank you for the government's willingness to support struggling businesses. We pray for those who are already wondering about the future viability of their business when this time comes to an end. We pray also for those whose jobs will be under threat. 
We pray for those who will not be receiving any government support. As we see the potentially catastrophic effect that this period could have on our economy for years to come, we look to you and ask that you would have mercy. And as we do so, we pray that you would forgive us for the way in which we as a nation have put our security in our wealth and not in you. We pray for those whose lives will never be the same again. We pray that as their world is shaken, so they might turn to you a rock of refuge in the midst of the crisis. And Father, we pray the same for the whole nation. Lord, we know that we have put our confidence in our wealth and we pray that as that is shaken, so we would turn and put our wealth, or put our trust in the one true eternal God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have given us grace to bring before you with one accord our common supplications. And you promise that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of your servants, as may be best for them, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the world to come the fullness of eternal life. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We will be continuing to broadcast our evening reflections throughout this Holy Week and then we will join together next Sunday on Easter Day to celebrate the resurrection. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.